Uh, I am thankful that you are here this morning, and I am truly delighted uh, to welcome our new chancellor to uh, Kutztown. It's his first visit, and hopefully it will be the first of many, many visits that Chancellor Brogan will bring to, will come to our campus. So we are really happy to have you here. We're looking forward to uh, hearing what you have to say and talking to you. And I know that there's a lot of people here that have been anxiously waiting to meet you. So I will not take any more time than to say welcome, and please, Chancellor. First of all, let me say thank you to the president, um, to the board members, some of whom are here uh, this morning joining us, to the chairman of uh, the Board of Governors for uh, the State University System, the PASHI system, um, uh, Guido Pacchini, who is with us this morning. Thank you all for coming out. He also has a rather soft spot in his heart for cuts down, so, uh, and he's not afraid to share that. Uh, <laughs> he said, you, you, as we walked across, he said, you come to your own conclusions about the most beautiful campus in the PASHI system. <laughs> I just, I want to stay out of your way, so uh, I did, and it is, a, it's a gorgeous campus. I am, um, uh, Fresh off of the circuit, I have, I think, after today, three or four more universities to visit to get to all 14, which is kind of interesting because I didn't have to do this when I became chancellor of the state university system in Florida because I was a president in that system, so I knew all the campuses, knew all the players, so I could put my first attention to other things. But here, um, I committed to the fact that never having been on these campuses and gotten to know people, that it was more important than I get out on the road, and there's a lot of those uh, in the Commonwealth. Um, as I've traveled around, I've, I've been to, as I say, I think nine uh, now. Good, Good morning. morning. You're late. Get it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's been a wonderful trip um, as, around the, the Commonwealth. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, so I'm not unfamiliar with Pennsylvania, but I can say this because I am in the Commonwealth. We think Ohio is a beautiful state, and it is, but it's got nothing on the Commonwealth. This is a remarkably beautiful state, um, you know, especially when you add in the mountains, and we don't really have those in Ohio to speak of. So you throw it all together, it's a remark remarkably beautiful place. Now, I will tell you, when I get back to the office late this afternoon, um, I will give them what I've now dubbed the DDR. The DDR is the Dead Deer Review. Because um, nobody's got anything on you when it comes to the number of carcasses, or is it carci, I'm not sure, uh, that, that are out there on the highways of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It's fairly remarkable. Uh, they've started giving me directions that way. They said, OK, you're going to Kunstown. Here's what you want to do. You go four dead deer north. <laughs> And when you pass the third dead deer, get off, because you'll be on Main Street. Um, but it is, it's a, it's a remarkably beautiful state, and we have remarkably beautiful campuses uh, within it with still three or four more to go, and I, I don't doubt they're just as uh, beautiful as are all the others. Also different than Florida. Now, it's not that Florida doesn't have really lovely campuses, but uh, A, there is a, a major age change here, uh, not among faculty, don't get me wrong. This is the same thing. Uh, but in terms of the history of the system, in Florida, you have the, the 12 universities uh, make up the state university system of Florida, the public universities. Uh, a little size difference. We are here about 115,000 students. The state university system is, in Florida is 12 universities with 340,000 students. It's an immense system. Uh, we have the University of Central Florida in Orlando, which is now at 62,000 students and continues to grow. Growth has slowed down a little bit, not because the growth potential still isn't the same. It's just how many can you continue to take in. Uh, Florida is now at about 50,000. Florida State's about 50,000. Uh, University of South Florida in Tampa. Uh, any geography people here uh, who are saying South Florida, Tampa? Isn't that about halfway down the peninsula? Yes, you're correct. But that was the last university created in the very early 60s in the system. There are now three below that that actually go all the way to Florida International University, which is in South Miami, which is literally South Florida. Uh, but um, they never changed the name of the University of South Florida. So it confuses some people. Uh, but uh, we have the lion's share of the universities in Florida uh, public were started somewhere in the early to mid 1960s. Uh, the university where I was president, Florida Atlantic University, is a school of about 31,000 students, and it was started in uh, 1964. 
uh, the population boom down there uh, didn't occur until just about the 50s and the early 60s and to try to keep up with it was a massive rush to create public universities. Most of our public universities who fall in that age range um, were created on former military bases. The federal government had significant tracts of land scattered around Florida, and as you can imagine, Florida was a fairly prominent player in especially World War II based on its location. And because of that, the feds had this uh, cachet of uh, property, and so they deeded it over a parcel at a time to the state specifically for purposes of uh, citing public education institutions. And the one where I was president, uh, which is uh, in Boca Raton, uh, was an immense flat 2,000 acre parcel of property uh, without a tree on it when it was first taken from the federal government because it was a former army air base. And by virtue of that fact, uh, there were still left many of the runways which were substituted and became uh, roadways and parking lots uh, for the university in its early days in the mid-1960s. Uh, parenthetically, it also was that, that site, the site during World War II for the first training of pilots and navigators for the newly invented radar systems uh, that, that became prevalent, obviously, in the latter part of the war. So uh, there's a history there, but nothing like this. Uh, this is remarkable as I travel around and see the history of not only the universities, but these incredible uh, towns and boroughs that surround them all over uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And it, I think it's also a statement uh, when you look beyond the dead deer as you're traveling around and you see these green signs that take you off of the exit ramps, how many higher education institutions? I mean, there are some of the exit ramps where there are as many as six higher education institutions listed on the sign. One was flapping on the bottom. It's like we're running out of room here in the Commonwealth uh, for newly ensconced institutions. Um, but that, again, I think is a testament to the Commonwealth that has forever believed in the power of education um, uh, to its, its constituents. So uh, I am delighted to be here. My family is delighted to be here uh, because I did not come alone. Uh, having completed, uh, closing in on five years as the chancellor of the Florida state system, uh, I came with my wife and our eight and a half year old son. Uh, now there are some of you sitting there thinking, isn't adoption a wonderful thing? <laughs> no, he's really my son. Um, <laughs> Uh, my, my late wife and I, who moved from Cincinnati when we graduated from the University of Cincinnati, went directly to uh, Florida back in 1976. Uh, we were both elementary school teachers uh, by training, and uh, then I moved into administration as a dean and assistant principal, school principal, and uh, then the superintendent of schools uh, in that part of the state of Florida before going off to Tallahassee for my first stint there as the state secretary of education for uh, pre-K through 12 education, and then stayed as the lieutenant governor for a term and a half. I stepped down in the middle of the second term to become president of Florida Atlantic University, which also uh, was special to me because while I was teaching fifth grade, I acquired a master's degree in administration and supervision from uh, Florida Atlantic University, never in my wildest dreams, I was in my uh, mid to late 20s, ever believing I would ever come back to the place as the president, um, but was very fortunate to be able to do that and served there for almost seven years. And uh, during that uh, period of time, uh, lost my first wife to breast cancer at 43, uh, just as I became the lieutenant governor, and then uh, spent several years single. As a matter of fact, took the, the famous oath that said, you know, I'll never get married again. It couldn't be that good again. And we were never able to have children, so I figured, you know, we'll do that either. Uh, never say never and never say always. Some years later, I met and married a beautiful young attorney. And when we, were, uh, when we went to Florida Atlantic University, the second year there, uh, you talk about a non-traditional uh, uh, presidency, Mr. President. Uh, one morning appeared on the front lawn, the 12-foot plywood stork bearing the words, it's a boy. <laughs> on the home of the president, you just don't see that very much in higher education. So Colby John uh, was uh, raised right in the middle of a university campus for his first five years of life, and we absolutely loved it. It was, it was an extraordinary experience. Uh, quick um, footnote there, this morning, 
uh, Mr. Eight and a Half Year Old is eating breakfast and I'm watching the news and the weather and I saw the white band go across this area and I kind of walked quietly over to the window and thought, I wonder, and I opened the window, all the roofs and all the car tops were covered with snow. He's never seen snow. So I said, Colby John, come here for just a minute. And he walked over to the window and I opened the window and there it was. And the rest of my morning was shot to hell. Um, <laughs> you would have thought we were in Aspen. Um, oh, we had, he had his pajamas on, had to get the shoes on, the side, go out and make snowballs. And off, had to do it off the hood of the car because there was none on the ground, but that was okay with him. This was, this was an extraordinary experience. So we put one of the snowballs in the freezer and we'll see how long uh, that memento lasts. Um, but that, that's part of this uh, wonderful opportunity is not only professional for me, but uh, very personal and very wonderful for my family. Uh, and we have thus far in the two months that we've been here thoroughly enjoyed uh, not only Pennsylvania, but more importantly, the people of Pennsylvania. It's an extraordinary place. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit this morning, and then, and then I do want to open it up for, for questions and answers, depending on how much time we have. So um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've been sharing as I've traveled to each of the universities. Uh, the one thing I don't do is vary the message, um, because uh, the message, I think, is important for the entire system. Clearly, there are people within our system going through different issues a in different ways. I understand that, and, but at the end of the day, the message um, it, it has to be the same because you, you, if you try changing the message from one to the other, you blur it, it gets confused and confounded, and, and I don't want that to happen. At each of the sites, I've been able to spend time with the president, very important to me. I've been able to have a forum just like this, very important to me, and take a tour of the campus just to get a general sense of uh, realizing their buildings, but nevertheless, try to get a feel for the personality of the community that our universities happen to be located in and the campuses themselves. And the one thing that becomes glaringly obvious uh, is the fact that while they are all very similar in many ways, they are all each quite unique. And that's a hallmark, I think, of our system, especially as we now go into the 21st century. Because when, when normal schools were created and popped up in a regional fashion around the Commonwealth so very long ago, the idea was that they not be really unique. The idea then was that we create a regional opportunity as a Commonwealth for the people who live generally in proximity to that school so that students could go off to school and yet remain at home in many ways. Uh, and have available to them a wide menu of academic opportunities so that if they couldn't go off to places elsewhere around the commonwealth of the country, they could still chase the degree of their choice. And so we offered uh, a, a, an expanse over years of academic array and opportunity. And of course, when, when this system started, even before it was a system by title and by law, but the 14 universities, uh, two or three of the hallmarks were one, proximity. Students could have access to a higher education, a public higher education opportunity in relative proximity to where they lived and grew up, uh, which provided great access opportunities uh, that might shut others out. Uh, two, cost, because it was a public um, education opportunity, the cost was proportionately lower than if they went off to a lot of the other institutions around the Commonwealth or the country. And three was the expanse of the program array. If you wanted it, chances were really good, they had it in your proximate uh, regional university. So you put those three things together, it created a benchmark niche for our 14 universities that have stood a long test of time. But the one thing we also know is everything is changing. Everything is relative now in terms of the students we're working with whose DNA is uh, largely the same as was ours, but nevertheless, where they're going at the end of the day is going to be dramatically different than even the world that we inherited when we came out of college in many ways. Certainly vastly different than a generation and two and three generations ago. So it requires of us the fact to, that we must uh, engage the parts of history that are important to carry forward with us as regional universities and now as a system, 
but at the same time begin to try to decide what each of us in the system will look like for the next 50 years for the university students that we serve. Uh, that sounds noble and it probably to some, not you, but to others, sounds easy. You just look at who you are and decide what you want to be. The one thing we know about higher education is um, it is slow to change. And that's okay. Uh, that's not a negative. Uh, it is not subject to fad. Uh, it is not subject to whim. Higher education changes slowly uh, because it, uh, first of all, appreciates its historic roots, and second of all, doesn't want to jump on every bandwagon that comes along. I'm an appreciator of STEM education, but I also acknowledge there are people out there who are passionate about STEM who don't know what STEM stands for. They just simply know they've read it, they've heard it, it's important, we need to do a heck of a lot more of it, whatever it is. The reality is we now, as a system, and some of you may not even be aware of this, uh, have boast uh, the leading degree production is STEM in our system and allied health. Uh, that uh, impresses and even surprises some people in downtown Harrisburg who preach, you need to do more STEM, until I tell them, did you know that that is our leading degree production area these days, is STEM education and allied health? And you get this almost, oh, what am I going to complain about now? Um, kind of a reaction. Uh, but at the end of the day, that is true. Now, here's what we aren't for those who are STEM aficionados or even those who are passionate about STEM. Here's what our system and our universities aren't. We are not nor should we ever become gigantic vocational technical facilities. While STEM is important, the balance is important. It is, I would submit, the balance between STEM education and the humanities and the arts and the fine arts, it, that, that balanced approach is what separates us from so many other educational delivery systems. The ability to send students out of here not only with a degree in their chosen area of major, but also send students out of here who can navigate their way into a world that is vastly different than it ever was before. And take with them the knowledge and the appreciation of an array of opportunities that they'll take away from Kutztown when they leave. That's a harder sell to some. But still today, I must admit, most people still understand that's what makes a university a very special place. That is what, in a well-balanced approach, creates the opportunities for students that do separate universities from virtually any other delivery system in education that you can think of. And we have to not only cherish it, we have to cling to it. It's getting harder and harder to do. Not the cherish part, the cling part. We've seen declining budgets coming from the General Assembly. Let me assure you, as a prophet from another land, who ain't? Uh, it's happening all over the country. And in Florida, uh, we have seen a 48% reduction in general revenue over the last eight years. It is happening everywhere in some shape or form to some degree. We're also, as a system, beginning to bump up in some locations uh, to the tuition market cap. Uh, because we, of course, with declining state revenue, uh, started, as most did, to increase uh, rather proportionally because it's not a one-to-one -one correlate. You do not get out of a student dollar a one-to-one -one match with a, a dollar loss from the state. It does not equate that way. It's more student dollars to make up one dollar from the state. And so based on a study that uh, came out a couple of years ago, the McGuire study here, a number of our universities have begun to bump up against the market cap. And that market cap can be felt in one of two ways. Either students can say in their families, we can no longer afford this, even with loans. But you also have the phenomena that says, if we're going to spend that much money, we'll take out a little bit more money in loans and open up the options that we have available to us. And the one thing we know statistically is uh, American families aren't afraid of loans. They will take them out in great numbers, uh, even if it means paying it back for the rest of their lives. And so by virtue of that fact, you're creating two impacts on the market. And one is the inability to pay at all that rate, and the other one is 
opening up whole new options that perhaps didn't exist before by people who were willing to pay the extra cost to open up those available options. Neither one is good as it relates to our system. Competition is always good. I revel in it, but at the end of the day, we have to remain for so many students their first choice and their last choice opportunity as 14 institutions of higher education. And we always have to be mindful, even and perhaps even in these very difficult economic times, we've got to continue to pay attention to the cost associated so that we're not pricing them out of the market. And, and that is a very delicate balance that exists in each of our universities. And again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Our universities, while very similar, are also quite unique. And that market of which I speak is very different university to university. It is not a common market. The market at Edinburgh is very different than the market uh, at Slippery Rock, right down the road. Uh, even though they are both regional universities in their own regard, how that cost impacts the people in that region is a very different thing. And therefore, the decisions that parents and students make is impacted in a unique way based on the market forces that they feel. So the same thing that made us what we are, which is uh, proximate geography, uh, which is costs, public costs, and which is academic array, are all things now that we are challenging, that we're questioning. And of course, questioning the basic assumptions is something we do in higher education. It is not a bad thing. It is important that we look at all of these issues that made us what we are and recognize how will these issues impact us going forward? Will just being close be enough? And I would submit in the mobile society in which we live now, it won't because students are now moving farther and farther away from uh, hearth and home and to find a higher education degree in places around the Commonwealth and around the country. So just saying we're within that regional sphere itself is not good enough anymore. Cost, I mentioned it, won't dwell on it, but it has to be taken into consideration. You cannot just continue to increase the cost of anything lest you challenge the basic assumption which is when are people going to stop buying what you're selling or when might they be unable to take advantage of what you offer because you've outrun their coverage. And then the program array. We, we have now the whole world at the feet of these uh, young men and young women for the most part, and I'm generalizing, not everyone, but I'm generalizing, grant me that, the, the, the knowledge that students are now making choices in a much larger way, not just in terms of geography and market costs, but academic programming. And they're na now able to go to places to chase a degree in an area of interest that they weren't able to chase years ago. And so it, it has required us, and I, I don't mean just us in the PASHI system, I mean us in higher education, especially in this time of declining revenue, to look at everything that we are and then very importantly decide what it is we want to be going forward. And therein lies the rub. It is very difficult to make that jump from what we've been for so very long in so many ways and decide how are we going to be organized around these students for the next 50 years. Will the way we've been organized for the last 50 allow us the ability to remain buoyant and relevant and important to the constituents we serve, which are the students who are here today and the ones who are going to come behind them, and so on and so on. And that requires smart people to sit down and have conversations. It requires them, and this is the hard part, to even think beyond themselves and what it is that they do to the future of the institutions and the students who will call it their home for a period of time. It's really a very difficult process, and I know in many ways I'm preaching to the choir, but I also want you to know that this is what I find as I travel from university to university in this system, and this is what I find as I travel the country and come from a state university system in Florida that is going through exactly the same process. That means program alignment. It means looking at each of our academic programs, not only as it relates to the institution, but I submit you can't do it in a silo. 
You make a change at Kutztown, it has a Doppler effect, a ripple effect that goes all across the system. If you close a program, you've got to make certain that there's still access to that somewhere or multiple places within the system. You open a new program. You have to look at not only the importance of the program relative to the institution, but what does that new program mean to the system and to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? And of course, we're now educating students even beyond the Commonwealth to the country and the world. But the system has a responsibility, and this is part of it, is to work with all 14 of our universities on program alignment. Because at the end of the day, we have to assure the people of this state that we are laid out academically so there is an opportunity for students anywhere in our system and opportunities collectively that will line up with the world in which they're going to live and the world where they're going to ultimately earn a living and raise their families. We hope it's here in the Commonwealth. Now the good news is you're, you're sitting in a state where about 90% of our students come from the Commonwealth and maybe even better, about 80% of those who graduate from our system stay in the Commonwealth as residents, as citizens. They're going to raise their families here. They're going to work here. They're going to charge the economic vitality of the Commonwealth. So that's a, an incredibly important part of who we are and what we do as the state university system. And it's something I remind the people of downtown all the time in Harrisburg. We are not a taker. We are a major giver to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Not just our young men and our young women who will make up the fabric of this state for many years to come, but we contribute every day to the economy of the Commonwealth. A, just because we exist. And B, because of what we are helping to create by way of the next generation of workforce for the Commonwealth. People who will give back to this Commonwealth over and over and over. There's two ways to spend money. One is just to spend it and the other one is to invest it. And I believe money invested in the state university system of Pennsylvania in our 14 institutions will give back to this state and I hate to sound overly noble, but I believe this. The country and the world over and over and over. This is so much more than, ex than an expenditure, than a ledger notation. This is a massive investment in a major fulcrum in the economic vibrancy of the Commonwealth. This state is going through a change. Surprise to all of you. I know it's not. This state made a living in certain businesses and industries that are not here anymore. The population in many parts of the Commonwealth are on the decline for a variety of reasons. This state is in itself a phase of transition and change. The only question remaining is what's on the other side? What's Pennsylvania going to look like 25 years from now? How's it going to be organized? What will be the opportunities for our graduates? And then what is our responsibility to make sure that our graduates are ready for that? These are big questions. And they're laid at our doorstep 14 times every single day. And the question is, and I think I know the answer, do we have the courage to pick it up and turn it into an action plan for the future that will not only be good for Kutztown, the other 13 institutions within our system, but the Commonwealth and all of the people in it at the end of the day and beyond. Large questions that are not easily answered. Large questions with answers that sometimes impact you and I as individuals, much less the things we love. But at the end of the day, it is all so much bigger than we are. It is all so important to all of the students here today and as I mentioned all of those yet to come. Online education is something I want to talk to you about for just a minute. Uh, it's a fascinating thing this phrase online education. Uh, again when you go to places like Harrisburg you will hear people say online education means you don't have to build any buildings anymore. Just put it all on the computer. You don't have to hire faculty anymore. Take the ones you've got and put them online education. Cure for the common cold? Online education. It's there right in front of you. You know, for as many people who boast online education as, as the future, you will get that many different answers as to what 
online education actually is. In many people's minds, it's no different than when I was a sixth grader, and oh, I remember this, the teacher once a week would roll a television set into our classroom and turn on a guy by the name of Monsieur Zeff. And for 30 minutes, he would teach us French. Uh, there was no talking to Monsieur Zeff or responding to him other than in rote fashion. And at the end of the 30 minutes, she would wheel the television back out and that was your French lesson for the day. Folks, this is 2013. There are some online education programs which aren't a heck of a lot different than Monsieur Zeff. People boast numbers. We did it in, did it in Florida. In Florida, we said we have over 30,000 online education courses available and 700 full degree options online. It's not a case of he who dies with the most online education offerings wins. What's the quality of the programming about? When a professor puts their name and credibility on the line by building that curriculum and putting it online, what are the assurances that it's going to be of high quality by way of production? What assessments do we use with online education? It's a very different world on the assessment side of the scale. Hey, what back of the house support services do we offer? Because you know, here's the rub. If we don't offer the same kinds of support services to students in online education that we do to students who come here in person, financial aid uh, information, advising, counseling, tutorial when they're struggling, on and on, if we don't provide that, students will drop out of online education much faster than traditional students do. You see, all you've got to do is say off and you're out. And without those back of the house support services, and look at some of the research around the country with some of the major online programs who boast the number of applicants and the number of people in, but they never show you the number of people who did not graduate once started because they're, they're dropping out in droves. If they start, they should be able to finish if they're seeking a degree. If they're taking a class to supplement what they do here at Kutztown in person, it's gotta be of high quality and blend with what our faculty do in the classroom on the traditional side every single, way, every single day. I'm one of those who believes that we ought to have a conversation in our system about online education. The fact that it's sort of an every man for himself approach to online education is great because it allows huge independence. But at the end of the day, how does our system define quality in online education? What sorts of assessments are available and which ones are used across the PASHI system? What back of the house services do we offer? And hey, is it necessary that we replicate 14 times all of the back of the house services? necessary to support an online education? Or might we be able to pool some of those resources and house them at a university and, and hub them out to the other 13 institutions if we don't have to do it 14 times every day? It's time that this system have a grand conversation about online education and what we believe it ought to be and has to be going forward as a system, both on an individual side and collectively as a system to make sure we get it right because it is too important. And it's far more than just Monsieur Zeff in terms of access. It is gonna determine whether people can not only access higher education, either by course or by degree, and the quality of it, which will determine the quality of their life. We've gotta have the courage, I think, to have those conversations and see where we wanna go not just as institutions, but as a system. I think there's some incredible things going on out, at, out there in our system in online education. We need to find them, we need to harness them, we need to share them in best practice to give everybody a chance to make sure that if a faculty member puts their name and their integrity on the line by putting it out there, that it is everything they believed it would be and translate to the needs of the students. Program array. I touched on it before, I'm gonna to touch on it again, then I wanna drill down for just a second to the uh, vastly exciting world of general education. Um, usually that's where six or eight people get up and leave. Um, no, general education is incredibly important. You know that. I was quite taken with the fact that the PASHI system as I looked at it was made up of 14 universities 
and the lion's share of what happens in this system is devoted to quality undergraduate education. Was it that? Was it that? Was it the? <laughs> it was. It was the Gen Ed thing, wasn't it? Gee, I got to pull that out. Um, that, that's sort of the hallmark of this system. Yes, we do graduate education, of course we do, and, and we do some research, but at the end of the day, this system grew up on undergraduate education. Now, we might take it for granted, but I can assure you, there are universities around uh, the country who have gotten so focused on uh, graduate education and research, because that's gotten to be sort of the sexy part of higher education out there, that some of them have actually turned their back on undergraduate education and put their eggs in those baskets. You could have a campus made up of 60,000 students, 45,000 of them in undergraduate education, but resources and attention being paid in a sort of disparate amount to graduate education and research, and essentially turn their back on the major emphasis of every great university in the country, undergraduate education. So it is about looking at our undergraduate education program, not only relative to each university, but how we're laid out there as a system, what we're offering, and very importantly, what makes one university unique from the other. It doesn't mean that that thing which makes them unique is the only thing they do, but I have found in my travels around this system that we are quite unique in our makeup. And each university has its own personality, and not just in terms of the campus and the town-gown relationship, but the academic programs that are offered, and those programs which have risen up over time as those signature programs that have made that campus and school unique from the others. And that is a very good approach to the world of higher education. Again, it doesn't mean you abandon everything else. I would believe that it makes everyone else raise their game. It makes the institution charge harder to see to it that everything that is offered is of the highest quality. But what separates one from the other? What makes one unique from the other? Gen Ed. Gen Ed was created, I believe, to provide a 30 credit hour or thereabouts experience made up of a collection of important courses in the humanities, in English, in science, and math, to be able to provide to those students a core curriculum of general education programming that once completed would make them a better major student and also provide them skills absolutely essential to get along out there in the real world once they graduate. I found a couple of the universities when I became chancellor in Florida had hundreds of courses that qualified in general education. I'm not sure that that's what we had in mind. Everybody loves choice, but I think it has become so overwhelming in some places that it's very difficult to try and decide what to take, and once taken, does it help to assure that you're leaving with a general education program that is going to provide for you a better opportunity to chase your major and to get along once you graduate? And what we did down there, and I, I really believe it's something we ought to talk about, is put a lot of smart people in a room and say, let's talk about Gen Ed. What kind of a Gen Ed track do we expect as a system? What programs must we consider for general education that do translate once connected one with the other to the major and then to the opportunity afterwards. Again, takes guts. There's not one person who doesn't believe that that course is, isn't critical or we wouldn't offer it. But are there some that we can embrace that might once collect it up make for a better opportunity toward major and beyond? And by the way, this doesn't take away a student's right to elective. I'll open it up in a minute. It doesn't take away a student's right to elective there were, there's still opportunity for elective courses on the way to the 120 credit hour degree. But I think we have to have the courage to have that conversation. And if not one change is made, at least come away with a comfort level that we've looked at it and that we're satisfied with the way that we do it. If that's the worst thing that happens, hey, we're better off as a system. Last couple of thoughts that I want to open up to you all. Um, we have a task force that is getting ready to start to look at the allocation process for the PASHI system. 
Again, you, this system does not have the corner market, uh, market cornered on the issue of FTE. So many states, I just came from one, have made a living for 25, 30 or more years on the back of FTE. FTE is code for the more bodies you got, the more money you get. Uh, nice, especially when there's lots of bodies around. But at the end of the day, with declining revenue from the state, with tuition getting harder and harder to generate because of market caps, it begs the question, and we had it at Edinburgh the other day, who's seen some significant declining enrollment. Mansfield Friday, significant declining enrollment. If our enrollment is smaller than someone else's, just generally, or moving toward becoming smaller than others, does that automatically mean we're less relevant? Well, under the FTE model, the answer is pretty much yes because the FTE model is based on the number of people you have and whether they're full-time or part-time students. It's a system that worked for a long time. I would submit it's a system that needs great review, up to and including recommendations to the General Assembly that there might be other ways to do this than just good old-fashioned FTE generation. It takes guts to ask the question, it takes guts to look at some of the possibilities that are out there, but that's one of the things the task force is going to be working on. By the way, uh, I did go to Edinburgh the other day. I got there before the pass closed, by the way. Um, the, the morning I left, apparently all heck broke loose and the snow came down in great uh, abundant amounts. But um, there they asked me the question, tuition, is there something that we can do because Ohio and New York are incentivizing their students to stay in Ohio and New York? We're right on the border. Is there a way we, in Edinburgh, might be able to become economically more attractive to students across the border because so many of our students are gone and their numbers are declining in terms of enrollment? Two, uh, our alignment with community college system. Uh, we didn't have to do that to a great extent as a system for a long time, and yet I would submit we did in Florida uh, that when you say to a student, you do your first two years in a community college, then you can transfer to one of our universities to finish your baccalaureate degree. There are a lot more people out there who would consider it if it was a more seamless approach so that students without great penalty could move from one institution to another. I'll just tell you straight up how it's done down there. And I didn't create this. This was way before me. They actually did, down there, a major emphasis on program alignment and on common course numbering to the point where a student down there takes their Associate of Arts degree. All of those courses transfer. They don't have to take them again, and they don't have to pay for them again. And they are guaranteed, upon successful completion of that Associate of Arts degree, they're guaranteed by law a place in the State University System of Florida. Not by university, although most of our universities have great relationships, especially with our local community colleges, that go beyond that and say, you get your AA degree from here, 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 we'll guarantee you a place in our university. And some go beyond that and say, we'll guarantee you a place in your major of choice, which is also not laid out in the law. It varies from place to place, but the fact that it aligns that way gives much greater opportunity to both students and institutions to seamlessly see students move throughout their selection of associate degree onto uh, baccalaureate degree. Um, I won't go any further because you got things to do. Yeah, and actually, I, uh, this is a class in here. Oh, you got a class in here? Yes. Oh, gee. Uh, can I take one? And, and you had your hand up early, so I'll take you. Cover. I would just like to know you keep saying we're going to have conversations. Are the conversations going to be with the faculty that teach the students? or the accountants that decide how much money we're supposed to make. Yeah. Okay? Because I've never seen conversation, never seen conversations that include the faculty. Yeah. Okay? We get mandates from the state, so I have no idea who the conversations yeah. are with. And like now I have to go and teach 150 students for the fourth time this week. Right. Okay? So you're talking FTEs. Well that's what we go by. FTEs. All right. Sure. And and, you know, same thing with the tuition. Penn State has the highest tuition of any state college in the United States. They're not turning students away. Right. Okay? You're talking about having a cap? Well, you can't get much higher than the highest in the country. Right. They're not losing students. But, baby, we ain't Penn State. 
Well, okay. But, and, and, no, 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 wait a minute. Let me give you an answer. Okay. Speech slash question. Let me give you an answer. First of all, I very much want the input of faculty as we make some of these decisions. Not to have the input of faculty when you're talking about general education as an example. It's, it's crazy. They're the ones who teach it. They're the ones who know it best. It is critical that faculty be at the table when we talk about that. We need faculty at the table when we talk about funding. Because you're right. Some people would say, no, 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 funding, that's at a different level. That's with different people. And, and you're correct. Sometimes we allow the money people to drive what we do rather than deciding what we're going to do and then ask how much is it going to cost to pay for that enterprise. We've got it backwards in that regard. I'm not disagreeing with you at all. Yes, people will have a voice and an opportunity in these decisions. It is critically important. But until we decide what issues we want to take up, how we're going to organize around those conversations, we're never going to be in a position to challenge the basic assumptions, decide what we want to do. Lastly, I want you to know about the, the legislative process. Um, some of my friends teach political science. Um, and I'm just reminding them it's far more art than science, um, jokingly, but it's true. Um, th this process that we call politics, which ultimately decides the question of mother's milk to our institutions, is about um, as inconsistent as you can imagine. You've all seen it. But the one thing I've learned over a lot of years is that you can throw yourself at the legislative process sort of haphazardly. Faculty goes and tells them one thing. Administration goes and tells them something else. Board members go and tell them something else. Students go, and they love to see the students. But at the end of the day, if the students are telling them something that the faculty didn't tell them, or that, you know, they this divide and conquer opportunity in the world of politics is real. As we develop our system-wide approach to the legislative process, we've got to be unified to the greatest degree possible. It doesn't mean people can't have their issues. That, that's fine. But on the things that matter most, we have got to pull together and tell a common story and, and ask in a way that is common to our needs and not just rely on whoever gets sent up there on what given day and who they manage to see and what their own agenda happens to be at that time. Having your own agenda and being part of an organized effort in this thing are not mutually exclusive, but at the end of the day, we've got to try to organize this thing in a way that will make the, the voice of the PASHI system undeniable and impossible to, uh, to ignore. And we've got to talk about some of these funding issues. We've got to talk about some of these issues of support and help. Here's a misconception, and that is that if you close down a program, you can just take the money from that program and start a new program over here with the same money. It doesn't work like that. Typically, by the time a program is closed down, and I'm generalizing, the program is generating so little that there is no money to move over and start a new program. So if you want new programs that are right for our system, we have to have help to be able to generate those new programs, to at least provide the seed corn to make them sustainable on their own over time. It is essential that we do that. And we're going to be working with people here and the other 13 universities to try to coordinate this effort best we can. Again, I'm not asking people to salute and march to, to somebody else's drummer. Each group has their own issues, but if we can rally around a common core of issues and know that whether it's a student in somebody's office, a president in somebody's office, a board member in somebody's office, faculty member in somebody's office, that people are talking about the same things and one of those is relevance. We've got to remind these people how critically important this system is, has been, and more importantly, how important it's going to be to the Commonwealth going forward. To assume that they already know that is a major mistake. Because while everybody else, Penn State, for example, is in there saying, let us tell you how many of our alum are out there changing the world and how many people we have, and every day, captains of business and industry, we've got to tell the same story. We've got remarkable people who graduated from this system who are changing the world. We've got remarkable students now. We are a major cog today, as I mentioned, just because we turned on the lights here today in the economic vibrancy of the Commonwealth and more contribute those 80% of our graduates
to the workforce needs of this state going forward. That's the message we have to sell, and then we have to tell them what we've got to try to do to continue to offer those services to our system and therefore the Commonwealth. You guys have been more than kind. There's going to be a class in here, and never take a faculty member's class away.